Hi, everyone. I'm very, very excited to welcome you all to a very special UH uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds with our 20th annual Jack Berman lecture today. Um, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Karen Wingfield uh, to speak with us. And next, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Robert Salata to say a few words about Dr. Jack Berman. Dr. Salata is the chair of the Department of, Department of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. He holds the Stairs Chair of uh, Excellence in Medicine and is a Master Clinician in Infectious Diseases. Thank you, Dr. Slada. Thank you, Apurva. And welcome everyone um, to this great event. First of all, I'd like to say a few words about uh, Jack Berman for, for whom this lecture is named. Uh, he was a graduate of CWRU in 1951. And um, he uh, really uh, served in many uh, capacities in the Cleveland area, particularly at St. Luke's Hospital when that was still open. Board certified in internal medicine with a special interest in hematology oncology. And he grew a practice over 40 years that ultimately uh, encompassed uh, 12,000 patients, imagine that. Uh, but after his passing, his family really felt that it was um, really enthusiastic about naming this lecture after him. This, as Apurva said, is our 20th occasion of this. The last three were women and we need to keep that momentum going. And <clears throat> uh, his wife, uh, Barbara, who uh, we also lost in the last several years, was a graduate also of the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences in, uh, at Case Western Reserve University as well. Uh, but uh, we are very pleased today uh, to have members of the Berman family with us. Uh, Joan uh, Berman uh, is here, but several other family members. And if you can mention those that are with us, Joan, that would be great. And thank you for your support again. Thank you so much for hosting this wonderful lecture, uh, <laughs> annual lecture in, in honor and memory of my father. I will just say we have many members on the Zoom today. My uh, brother and Dr. Jack Berman's son, Jeff Berman, who has had a career in pulmonary medicine at Boston University Medical Center. Uh, my nephew and Dr. Berman's grandson, Jacob Burchuk, who is a, an oncologist at Dana-Farber in Boston, and his wife, Caroline Burchuk, who is a family medicine practitioner, my sister, Amy Burchuk, and uh, her husband, Andrew, can't be here because he's in the operating room today. Uh. And many of us, my husband included, who are case uh, Western Reserve grads, and there's a legacy of Case Western Reserve Medical School and, and uh, university people here. So thank you so much, and I can't wait to hear Dr. Winkfield. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joan, and welcome to the Berman family. Uh, it's great that you could be with us and, and share in these uh, exciting lectures that we've uh, been able to do be, uh, uh, because of your support. In your father, in your father's memory, uh, Dr. Karen Winkfield um, is with us today, and she is uh, currently the executive director of the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, uh, the Ingram Professor of Cancer Research, Professor of Radiation Oncology at Vanderbilt University. Uh, she, as noted, uh, uh, specializes in the treatment of hematology and breast malignancies. Uh, she leverages her experience as the executive director uh, uh, for uh, the purposes of looking at implementation science uh, to improving health uh, outcomes for underserved populations through the community. She um, <clears throat> obtained her MD and PhD, degrees, a PhD degree at Duke University. We we're hearing about that a little bit before everyone joined us. She also did her residency training at Harvard. Her leadership roles have focused on developing bi-directional communication between researchers and the community to ensure equitable access to care, regardless of race or ethnicity, geographic location, or socioeconomic status. She is a thought leader in espousing the importance of workforce diversity 
to improve health equity. She was recently elected to the ASCO board, and that's in oncology, as well as uh, an appointment by President Biden to the National Cancer Advisory Board. We are so pleased to have her here today. Uh, and uh, Karen, um, her uh, lecture will be uh, about improving equity in cancer care during a pandemic. So we'll hear a little bit about COVID as well and how it's impacted our cancer patients. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Karen. We look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salat. I really appreciate that. And I want to thank uh, Usha and, and Dina so much for helping to coordinate for the invitation. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, you know, for me as a radiation oncologist, um, to have an opportunity to participate in this lectureship that's named for someone who's so big in hematology oncology, it's, it's really incredible. And to know that we have that connection, uh, as Dr. Slaughter mentioned, I had indicated that I actually worked with uh, Dr. Andrew Burchuk at, when I was at Duke getting my PhD. Um, you know, we, we shared a lab and it's, it's just a wonderful connection. It really is a small world. And I wanna thank the Berman family for continuing this legacy. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist, but I actually consider myself a community engagement expert. I think that the face of medicine needs to change. We need to be more thoughtful about the people that we serve, the individuals who are at the receiving end of the work that we do. We wanna make sure that everyone has the same opportunity to not only survive cancer, but whatever disease, whatever ailment they have, and to survive it well. So how do we propagate wellness? How do we do that during a pandemic? We were just kind of remarking on the fact that it would be wonderful to be meeting in person. It would be great to be able to do that. And the comment was, well, maybe another year, <laughs> right? But there are so many things that have changed because of COVID-19 and, and certainly um, even the work that I do has expanded. So my work at the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance has really expanded beyond cancer. Am I still doing cancer work? Yes. But I tell you, the thing that is really exciting to me is this opportunity to think beyond cancer. How can we be great stewards of this thing called medicine? How do we make sure that the things that we're doing resonate and are helpful to the communities that we serve? This is one of the maps that I like to show folks that kind of looks at the impact that COVID-19 has had on the world. And I pulled this data yesterday, and you'll see in the slides that I get from the NIH. So I work and have been working with the National Institutes of Health on their Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities, been working with them for a year and a half, trying to figure out how do we make sure that as we are studying um, the vaccines, uh, making sure that they work, that all communities have access to the clinical trials. How do we make sure that as the vaccines are rolled out, that all communities have access to the vaccines? Doesn't matter if they're from a geographic perspective or from a racial ethnic, ethnic dis um, background, we need to make sure that everyone has access to this, this amazing opportunity. But we know that that hasn't always been the case. When we look at how many people have been impacted by the pandemic, it's really just heart-rending. Look at this. This is the weekly cases. If you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer or not, but if you look at the red panel, top right corner of this slide, there's been a massive upswing in the number of cases of COVID. And this is despite the fact that we have about 70% of the US population vaccinated. This is actually looking at the world cases. What's interesting to note is that if you look at the number of deaths, it's not as high as it was with the Delta variant or others. It's Omicron is different. Some of it is related to the fact that we have been vaccinated, but others are just likely related to this type of variant. But I don't want us to, to say, well, this is, this is good. I mean, it is in some ways, right? The fact that, you know, we are slowing things down 
However, if you look at the number of cases in the United States, this slide deck was actually, this slide was from January 24th. The numbers I just showed you were from yesterday. And if you look at the number of U.S. population that's been impacted, we've had over 6 million cases in less than two weeks. What's happening is it's actually causing some problems at the point of care. The hospitalizations are still there. Maybe people aren't dying of COVID as quickly as they had or as much as they had been, but it is certainly putting a strain on the healthcare system. And this is despite the fact, again, we've got about 70%, 75% of people in the United States have had at least one dose, but we're still far from being fully vaccinated and still individuals are not quite boosted. So we've got a little work to do so that we can avoid situations like this. I can tell you, I have friends of mine who, you know, still from, from my Boston days who when this pandemic started back in 2020, the hospitals were overwhelmed. This was the, the everyday situation, although people were all wearing PPD and uh, PPE and it was, it was just a nightmare. But there are actually hospitals in the Midwest where this is indeed the case today. Beds sitting in hallways patients just feeling overwhelmed. And the challenge is that this is the COVID, if these are patients with COVID, what happens when somebody has a heart attack? Or when somebody perhaps has a pulmonary embolus who's you know, undergoing chemotherapy? The challenge is not just for the patients, it's for the providers as well. And there's so much that we need to think about when we look at our healthcare system. Very important to look at patients, We've got to look at providers. We need to look at systems. And so one of the things that I'm very pleased on, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, and National Cancer Institutes have been very well um, focused <laughs> on how do we think differently about our healthcare system during this pandemic. We know we need to have a much better public health infrastructure. How can we do that without burning out our providers? How do we make sure that we are ensuring that we have equity across the system so that everybody has access? And you can imagine, I know that we've changed the way that we practice oncology care, right? We've had to make adjustments. As a radiation oncologist, breast cancer, let me just give that an example because that's one of the most common um, cancers that we, we treat in radiation oncology is breast. And traditionally, the course of, of radiation might be six weeks long. In Canada and UK, they've been shortening that. But I tell you, the pandemic, it's amazing. We actually said, okay, we are gonna fully onboard what we call hypofractionation, reducing the number of treatments that patients get from a breast cancer perspective, unless there's a clinical reason to not do so. And those are few and far between. So overnight, <laughs> we went from having one standard operating procedure to really shifting and changing. And think about what's happened in oncology clinics, the same, right? Before, when patients could bring their families in, they could join in in the conversations. Patients were unfortunately sometimes getting the bad news all by themselves, sitting in a room, alone, afraid, without their family members nearby to support them. Our doctors already feeling overwhelmed, some of them not only working as oncologists, but also working in COVID wards. Very stressful time, very stressful time. But think about the people who may not have even had anyone to come with them. Or what about the individuals who may, we may be able to use uh, telehealth? Again, this was another thing. This is a policy piece where we had been fighting as providers for the longest time to be able to improve access to care through the use of telehealth. Can we actually make it so that patients can be seen while they're at home? If it's just a simple checkup from an oncology treatment to make sure that the patient is doing well, do they really have to drive in? Do they have to take public transportation to come in for a checkup, which very easily could have been done virtually? But from a policy standpoint, that was a big hang up. We said, no, you can do that, but you're not gonna get paid. How do we keep the system running when there are all these policy implications? Well, once again, during the pandemic, Amazing how quickly that changed. And now we're able to provide opportunities for patients and providers to communicate virtually, to avoid them having to come in when it's unnecessary. It's a really great and wonderful thing to be able to do that. 
But I want to remind us that the conversation today is about equity. And so even something as quote unquote simple as telehealth, virtual visits, not everyone has access to that. We do have a digital divide in this nation. There are some who have and some who do not have. And it's not just related to whether or not they have the equipment. That's one component. Do people have um, computer systems at home? Do they have cell phones, smartphones that will enable them to have those conversations? It's also about broadband access. You think about our rural communities. There are some communities in North Carolina where when I was the associate director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center at Wake Forest, where literally we would drive out west and we would lose cell phone service for about 20 to 30 minutes while we were driving through the mountains. And there are people who live there. We are seeing the same thing during the pandemic with students, children who are going to school and having to work from I mean, do the school work from home. Uh, many schools are now back in person, much to the parents' chagrin because they closed down and kids are coming home, sometimes with COVID. But think about the digital divide. Something that, man, here we are, 21st century, it's 2022. And there are still challenges with respect to making sure there's equity in terms of digital access. For some of us, this is not a surprise. For folks like me who've been doing this equity work for several decades, it's not a surprise. But it's something that people's eyes have been open to during the pandemic, that there are individuals who have different circumstance, their context is different. And it's important for us to understand that so we can put our minds together collectively to say, how are we gonna do this healthcare thing differently? What is it that we need to do to make sure there is equity in the system to ensure that people have the healthcare that they need. I must say one of the things that has come to resonate for me over and over again is this concept of precision medicine. Oncologists use it a lot. Right? We talk about precision oncology. We talk about the genomic tests that can be done to identify whether there are specific targets that we can potentially create or have antibodies to or immunomodulators. What are the specifics related to one's cancer that potentially can help not only improve cancer therapeutics, but actually reduce the toxicity, right? This is personalized cancer therapy. And we call that precision oncology. Are there specific things in the tumor that may actually make it more susceptible to one drug or another? Is there something inherent within a person's body that may make their immune system rev up to one therapy or another? That's personalized cancer therapy. It's precision medicine. But one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is the importance of thinking about precision medicine from a more global context. What are the things that make up that person's experience? Yes, it's the omics, right? Yes, it's the imaging. Yes, it's their biology, the microbiome, the expososomes. What are the things that they come across in their daily life. But look at the center there. It's also community. It's the providers. It's that entire social context. And so that also is precision medicine. Thinking about the population is really important. Let's think globally. What are the things that we can do to help improve access, right? Telehealth making sure that happens. What are the things that we can make sure that if a person has cancer or has HIV, that we can actually personalize their experience? Hmm. What are the things we can do during a pandemic? Maybe we shorten the course of radiation. Maybe that's what we can do to help make sure people feel safe. What are the things that we can do internally to make sure we're taking care of the workforce that's so vital during this pandemic, to make sure their voices are being heard? And most importantly, what is it that we can do at the point of care for each individual patient that we see, that we come across? How do we make sure that they are taken care of? The topic today of improving cancer, improving equity in cancer care is really about patient-centeredness. It's about what are the things that we do 
both collectively as providers, as institutions, but also individually, looking at the person who's sitting in front of us. And it's about culture. Yes, collaboration, communication, important. Yes, the quality of care is important as well. But what is the culture at your institution? And has it been flexible during the pandemic? Culture is really important because those values that we have institutionally, every institution has a mission and vision statement that kind of speaks to some of the values. Many of them are not like, well, we value making money. I, I don't think that's what the hospital system would say, but I could be wrong. Most of the time, it's about ensuring each patient has an experience that we see them, that we value them, that we respect them. But my thought today is gonna to be around, have we created inclusive cultures? Environments where people can feel safe to say who they are, to disclose who they are without being judged. I had the opportunity to come to Case Western a couple of years ago um, and to really talk about LGBTQ plus community, about the fact that they are certainly underserved with respect to cancer. But if you think about it, half the time, we're not even asking SOGI questions. We don't even ask about sexual orientation or gender identity. So what's the culture like at your institution, in your department, in your clinic? Are we asking people what their preferred language is, how they would like to receive their healthcare information? And it's hard during the pandemic, right? We may not have as many interpreters on staff. Maybe we have to do it through one of those video consoles, or maybe we have to have the patient when they're calling in, you know, go through a translation line. These are things that we can do even during a pandemic to ensure access. But these are also lessons that we can learn and how can we build upon them to say, this is a safe space for our patients, regardless of who they are. How do we create that safe space? And what are the lessons that we're learning during this pandemic that can help us not only do it now, but also extend it so that we have sustainability in having equity front and center in the way that we treat the patients that are sitting in front of us. Precision medicine, personalized medicine, personalized care. We do it all the time as providers. We say, well, this person who's sitting in front of me, what is the correct, what is the, what is the treatment plan for this person? We do that. But I want us to start also thinking about them holistically, not about just their disease. And I wanna share a few examples of how we can do that, not only now during the pandemic, but how we can think about doing this long-term. Seeing the person sitting in front of us, having a holistic approach, making sure we're asking them what they need. It's less about cultural competence, because I hear that a lot. I don't quite like that term, because as you know, in medicine, we can use competencies as checkboxes. This is not a checkbox. This individual, this person, this human being is not a checkbox. So I like to think of having culture humility as a way to say, who is this person sitting in front of me? What are their needs? And how can I help them get there? especially during one of the most difficult times in the United States history. This is about patient-centeredness, patient-centered care. You know, I'm very honored. I was just recently awarded a $2 million grant uh, from the patient-centered uh, research program, PCORI, to help lead the national efforts around how to do stakeholder engagement. And one of the things that I like to tell organizations that are truly interested in thinking about equity and thinking about patient centeredness is for them to know that it's not just about the physician who's sitting across from that patient. It's not just about maybe the nurse staff. Yes, I believe in workforce diversity. I believe in making sure that people have, have this awareness uh, that we need to be thoughtful about that person in the context that they find themselves in, but this needs to be integrated into all aspects of the care system. Take a cancer center, for example. First contact a person might have is whomever answers the phone. What are we doing to improve the patient-centered care with the people who are answering the phone at our institution? What about the people who are sitting at the front desk? Are they focused on patient-centeredness? Or perhaps the medical assistant? Or perhaps it's a research team member Thinking about patient-centeredness must be woven throughout 
the mission, the value statements. And it needs to be an iterative process. It can't be a one and done. But to think about the fact that we need to be mindful that these people who are coming, who are trusting us with their health care, we've got to show them that we are trustworthy and prove that by the way that we interact. And that means the entire system has to be on board. And that can be a challenge. This is the leadership challenge moving into the next phase of medicine. We saw the detriment. We saw the flaws during the pandemic. We still see it. The fact that we do not have 100% vaccine rates. People do not trust the system. So how do we engender trustworthiness? It's really about seeing that person sitting right in front of you. And I must say, again, the pandemic has certainly opened up the fact that some were not aware that there are certain populations that are at greatest risk for exclusion, not feeling welcome, not feeling included. I put at the top of this list, adolescent and young adults, one of the communities that I hadn't really thought of. In the work that I was doing, when I finally started to say, okay, what do we need to do? What do we think about? Somebody mentioned to me, well, what about adolescent and young adults? And I was like, well, what, what about them, right? I mean, it's okay to not know. It's just about being open. And so I put them on the top of my list now, adolescent young adults, those individuals who are between the ages 15 to 39, oftentimes are one of the most underserved populations when it comes to cancer care. And you think about healthcare in general, a lot of times people are, well, they're young, they may not need it, but unfortunately they can be some of the populations that slips through the crack. So while I'm gonna to shape today's discussion around equity from a racial ethic lens, do know that these are all of the populations we're referring to. Older adult populations, racial and ethnic, ethnic minorities, yes, rural communities. And one of the things that's important to know is that unfortunately socioeconomic status in this country impacts one's ability to access care. Again, we saw it during the pandemic, right? There were people who literally could not get tested or could not participate in clinical trials or who didn't have access to the vaccines because they didn't have transportation here in the United States. Yeah. But I'm gonna use the example again of cancer. I am an oncologist. We do wanna talk about cancer just a little bit. Really important to note that we have done a wonderful job of reducing death and mortality from cancer. You heard the president say it. I was very honored to be at the White House on February 2nd when he announced the Moonshot 2.0. And to hear him talk about the fact that over the past 20 years, cancer mortality rates have declined by over 25%. We can do this. We've been doing this. We've been serving the needs of the communities. Unfortunately, not everyone has had the same access. Not everyone has benefited the same way. There is some inequity. So last year in September of 2020, actually two years ago now almost, holy cow, 2020, the, the AACR actually put out their uh, report, very first one that they did on cancer disparities, this is a progress report. And while again, all the trend lines are coming down, meaning we are curing cancers or having people live longer with cancer, cancer is becoming more of a chronic illness. If you look at the death rates and the trends, that top line there, that yellow line, showing that African-Americans, there's still a gap between blacks and other racial ethnic groups. Again, there's been some global improvement, but why the gaps? Why is that still there? And I tell you, this is the age old question. Is it nature versus nurture? When I was back in the lab with Andrew Burchuk and Jeff Marks, these are some of the questions I was asking from an oncologic standpoint. Is there something biologically inherent that's different in black people versus what we see in other racial ethnic groups? Is there a genetic abnormality? Is there something that predisposes them to cancer in a different way, to having worse outcomes? And one of the things that really quickly opened my eyes when I went to Boston, we had over 400 oncology clinical trials open in the entire Harvard system. And yet there was a lack of diversity, despite the fact that Boston is a majority minority city. It started my journey to understand this issue about access. And it also started my journey to understand that the social determinants of health are truly one of the greatest barriers that we have to providing equitable care. Predated the pandemic, but many people's eyes were opened because of it. If you look at the disparities, let's look at just race and ethnicity right now. African-Americans have the worst, worst burden 
of all of these diseases across the board, obesity, cardiovascular disease, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19, as you've heard. Why is that? Why is that one population has that risk? Well, there are certain factors that obviously increase COVID-19 risk, but those of us who are oncologists, those of us who do care for people in these urgent situations, those of us who see patients who have HIV AIDS understand that many of the things, the factors that increase risk for patients to develop or have exposures to COVID-19 or develop morbidity and mortality related to COVID-19 are all the same. Living conditions, work circumstances. We know in oncology care, sometimes people talk about the fact they can't take off from work. <laughs> you know, they've got to put food on the table. They may be the, the breadwinner for their family, or maybe they're working two jobs and they're worried because they don't have a salaried job. They are working hourly and get paid hourly. And if it takes an hour you know, to get to your appointment and then you're waiting for your doctor for an hour and you get seen for 10 minutes and then have to go back, that's half a day. That's circumstance. And then the health circumstance, we know that lots of folks lost their health care insurance during the pandemic. And unfortunately, we still have some states that have not expanded Medicaid. Lots of folks are uninsured or underinsured. So these are all the things that we need to think about is these systemic inequities that unfortunately disproportionately impact certain communities. Not just race, ethnicity, right? Rural, adolescent, young adult, all of those populations. Again, I think it's really important to think about one of the greatest predictors of health, the socioeconomic status. Why is it that a zip code can dictate whether or not you're going to live longer than one person? Why should zip code determine your lifespan? It does, unfortunately, here in the United States. Socioeconomic status, income, occupation, education, the greatest predictor of health. And it plays out. And when you think about the fact that we are capturing, you know, what happens for children, we think about the fact that children who grow up in poverty are seven times more likely to have poor health outcomes. That's lifelong. We don't oftentimes ask the questions of people sitting in front of us. Where are your needs? Do you have food insecurity? Do you have any issues getting to treatment today? Is there anything that you need that can make your journey better? We heard the president talk about not only wanting to decrease mortality from cancer by 50%, but also improving the patient experience. Not only the patient's experience, but their family. That means we have got to interact with them. We have to be humble. We've got to figure out who that person is sitting in front of us and knowing what their needs are. And I've got to just give a shout out to Dr. David Williams and other colleagues who are involved in this um, documentary series. It's pretty old at this point on natural causes. Some people may not have, have watched it, but it's really important. It talks about wealth being a driver of health and health outcomes here in the United States. So there's such an important thing for us to understand. And so it's really a challenge, I think, sometimes where we say, well, what are the things that are factoring into wealth? I'm, redlining is one of them. Those of you who may not be familiar with the term, this was a program that was set up by the US government that allowed for insurance companies and mortgage companies to disproportionately um, block families and families of color from actually having mortgages. And it created these districts that are called red line districts, literally outlining the quote unquote undesirable regions of particular cities and unfortunately, that's where a lot of the black people ended up. And that, as you know, your zip code, <laughs> as we just talked about, can dictate not only your lifespan, but also dictates what school your kids go to, right? What the resources are that are put into those, those schools. As we just heard, poverty that impacts children can have lifelong effects on their health and their health outcomes. Literacy, it matters. And what happens for early childhood education is one of the greatest drivers of the success. But yet we allow zip code to dictate whether or not a child will have access to excellent education or not. This may be a county that you're familiar with. I think it's, what is it, Cayuga County? Did I pronounce that right? Might not have. <laughs> Somewhere in Cleveland. 
But this is an example of one of these red line maps. And you all may see, and you might kind of recognize the geography much better than I am, than I do. But I must say, when I've looked at these maps in the cities that I've kind of worked in, and I overlay where the red line districts are, I can also exactly overlay where the areas of poverty are. I can overlay the mortality from cancer. I can overlay infant mortality, right? All of these things are predicted based on the wealth of these particular communities. And that's structural. That's a structural barrier that was put in place decades ago, but still has impact today. So you may say, man, well, I thought we were supposed to be talking about stuff that's happening in the pandemic. Yes, but we've got to think about the root cause. We have to understand the context that people find themselves in. Why is it that we're still having these conversations? It's because some of these structural barriers still exist. So it begs the question for those of us who are in the healthcare systems, like, man, you know, how am I supposed to handle all of that, right? I'm only one person or we're one system. And it's true. Population health, you think about it, the pie. You slice up that pie. Medical care itself only accounts for about 20 to 25% of population health. It's really that whole social context. It's the social ecology that folks find themselves in. It's the policies that are created that can make or break an institution's ability to serve the patients that are walking through the door, an institution's ability to serve the community, not just the patients that walk through the door. What is our true responsibility? If the pandemic has not shown us one thing, it certainly has shown us that what happens in the communities around us will absolutely impact our ability to take care of not only people who are walking through the doors, but take care of ourselves, our families. So we've got to start to, to, yes, hone in on the person sitting in front of us, understand their social context, but also think what is it that we can do more broadly to really think differently about the way healthcare is delivered in the United States. So what is it gonna take? It is gonna take leadership. It is gonna take will. And it is gonna take people to say, all right, what is it that I am actually willing to do where I am? As a provider, as a healthcare leader, what are the things I'm willing to do? You know, Rob Wynn, I'm not sure how many of you know him, but he is the Cancer Center Director at VCU Massey. Uh, he and I just recently wrote a paper, it should be coming out within the next few weeks, that really looks at improving <laughs> equity during the pandemic. And it gave some nice break, breakdown of some of the historical context so that people can understand. But then we do have really a nice table that says, these are not new concepts, what we're suggesting. <laughs> You know, the country has actually done a lot of work looking at equity for decades. Institutes of Medicine has published reports. Oftentimes, though, those reports get put on the back shelf because it does take will. It does take desire. It does take an investment. And I tell you, the investment is really important. We've got to start thinking about it because I tell you, the AACR report that I had mentioned earlier that came out that looked at cancer disparities talked about the fact that those cancer disparities are costing the United States people a trillion dollars every three years, one trillion dollars. And that's just cancer. <laughs> We're not even talking about all the other healthcare disparities. So we've got to think about how to do it. And so these social determinants of health are really important. I love this slide. I pulled this from cancer uh, from the Kaiser Family Foundation because it's, it breaks down the different categories. Sometimes when people say social determinants of health, it can be a little bit overwhelming. But really thinking about food, right? Access to food, food deserts we hear about all the time, education, economic stability we've talked about, but that social context. And so asking people at the point of care what their social context is, is really important, we don't often do it because sometimes we shy away because we're like, I don't have resources to help assist that person. I'm going to provide you some resources today. The healthcare system is part of the social determinants of health. We must think of ourselves as part of what makes up that social context, of what can make or break a person's experience. It's really important for us to see ourselves in that work. So let me start by saying one of the things that I was really struck by, I had a resident, I believe, um, at one of the ASCO meetings, American Society of Clinical Oncology, talk about the fact that they had done a study looking at food insecurity, and about 30% of cancer patients when they walk through the door have some form of, of food insecurity here in the United States. 
They may not know where their next meal is coming from. They may not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. It's something that I hadn't personally thought about. You know, again, it's okay to not know, but are you open to knowing? And are you open to saying, what can I do about that? I think one of the things that's important to think about is how do we ask the questions? <laughs> so I wanted to provide you all with some tools. These are some screening tools that have certainly um, shown some value and benefit into looking at and thinking about the social determinants of health. Many of these are used in the primary care setting already. Um, but it's your short forms, they can be short questions. I oftentimes tell my trainees, my residents, you can oftentimes ask a lot of these questions even during the physical exam. You know, things as simple as, hey, you know, you, you feel like you might have any issues coming into treatment today, right? Um, or coming into treatment each time. Radiation in particular, since it's every day, but certainly for those getting infusional, chemotherapy, or coming for other treatments, coming to visit their doctors in general. Asking short questions during the course of a physical exam can oftentimes take the weirdness out of asking some of these questions uh, related to health. But these are some examples um, of, of, tool, of um, toolkits that can be used to ask the questions. I do want to point your attention to this paper that my colleagues and I wrote earlier uh, last year, Lessons Learned from, around addressing, uh, from COVID-19 to Addressing uh, Cancer Care. Here are some of the things that we kind of outlined. It's really important to do more research around these things. Um, implementation science, you heard that term kind of talked about, is really important. I worked in Boston, I've worked in North Carolina, now work in Tennessee. Um, I, I, one thing might work okay <laughs> in one area, might not work the same in, an, in a different area, right? What happened in Boston might not be applicable to what I can implement in North Carolina. So implementation science is taking something that is proven, something that's worked before, and tweaking it, meeting the needs of the community. How do you do that? You need to collaborate with communities and community-based researchers. That's all important. I certainly, again, I'm a workforce person. We've got to have diversity. We've got to meet people where they are. People need to be able to see themselves and the work that we're doing, important as well. But I would challenge folks, and this is in that paper as well, so please, hopefully you'll take a look at it, is challenging what the policies are in your department, in your division, in your institution, regarding creating fairness in the system, creating equity and ensuring equity is there. These are all things that we can do and I saw, again, I think it's really important to, to just think more broadly about the way that we define equity in the work that we do every day. I must say, we can't do this by ourselves as individuals, <laughs> as departments, as much as we need to think about it. But, you know, again, a lot of providers are like, I don't want to ask about food insecurity if I don't know where to send people, all right? If they say that they're hungry or that their families are hungry, what do you do? Many institutions don't have enough social workers or don't have enough resources available internally. Um, and again, social workers, I think, oftentimes get looked at as resource allocators when really their jobs are much bigger than that. And we do need to have them working to the top of their licensure, which is around, you know, kind of thinking about um, social supports and psychosocial supports as well. But this is where I believe that community, that in community engagement, remember I said I, I consider myself a community engagement expert, we've got to leverage our communities. There are so many incredible community-based organizations that are doing fantastic work. And we can leverage them to really improve equity, not only during the pandemic, but you know, long term. So I want to share with you a couple of examples. These are local examples of groups that I've worked with when I was in, in Winston-Salem. Cancer Services was an amazing um, organization that raised funds through a variety of different fundraising avenues. And what they did was they used all those monies to help support patients and their families you know, during a cancer journey. Didn't matter where they were across institutions. They certainly um, worked with Wake Forest when I was there, but other institutions as well. And they just do an amazing job. They meet people where they are. And so while my institution might not have had the capacity to pay for someone's childcare or something like that, I could make a referral to Cancer Services to help that person meet their needs. So while I asked the question, do you foresee any barriers coming into treatment? And they say, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with my children. I need childcare we had a resource that we can point them to. Or if they say, you know, I'm struggling with paying my mortgage or the light bill or whatever, we had a resource to go to. They even had wellness groups and different sorts of things. So you might not have to do everything yourself. How do you leverage what's happening already in your communities to serve the person sitting right in front of you? Don't forget about your Department of Public Health. I've had incredible partnerships in most of the cities that I've been in with the Department of Public Health because they actually do provide transportation services. They can help with insurance. They have 
in lots of information. For those who might be interested, fellows, residents, trainees might be interested in getting involved, look for the, the Comprehensive Cancer Prevention and Control Network. Look for that in your state. Look to find out who's helping with the cancer control plan in your state and see if you can get involved. I got involved early on when I was at, at Harvard um, with the state plan and thinking about cancer care in a different way. And again, this is where we improve what our public health infrastructure is so that we can change who is at the table. We can bring our voice, we can bring the voice of the communities we serve to those tables. Here are some other um, resources. I love 211.org. It's a, a number, it's a, it's a um, website, but it's also, they have phone numbers. 211.org will actually put patients in touch with resources near them. So it doesn't matter where you are in the country. You can go to 211.org and you can say, I have a patient who's undergoing therapy and they need access to, boom. And what I like to encourage is that we empower our patients to do that. We empower our families to do that. But here are some other um, organizations. Again, I'll make sure you guys have access to the slide deck so you will have these resources. But 2 was one of my favorite ones that I just learned about that I wanted to share with you today. Um, it does provide some resources. So don't be afraid to ask people what their needs might be. Because even if you might not be able to meet them locally, there are other organizations that can help provide some support around that. Community engagement is not public outreach. And again, the pandemic has shown us this. We, we know that there's been public outreach about the need, the importance of kind of vaccine uptake, but part of the challenge is again, we haven't had the public health infrastructure. infrastructure. We haven't had that community engagement where we actually are looking to build long-term relationships with our community because they're looking at healthcare institutions as partners. This is where the sustainability is. Community engagement is not just about a single thing or looking for a one-time input. It's bi-directional communication, meeting people where they, where they are, meeting communities where they are so we understand what their needs are so that we can advocate for equity. One thing I want to point your attention to, if there are those of you interested in understanding more about redlining in Cleveland, this is a group that I actually found. It's called Undesign the Red Line. They have an interactive exhibit. You can go online. I put the, the website um, down below, but they're actively looking to do things to help change the landscape locally. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Communicate. Work with the, the folks in the community that are already doing the work. Learn about what some of the needs are for the different communities that you help, that you're serving. It's really important. And we need to do this across the entire cancer control continuum. So you've heard that the screening rates for, for, for um, cancer are down. They're getting better, but some of them dipped by 80%. And we know that that's actually causing stage migration, that patients are presenting with later stage disease. We've got to fix that. So what can you do individually? If you haven't gotten screened, please do so. <laughs> Encourage your family members to do so. But are there things that we can do in our communities to help encourage people to get cancer screening? Or are there things that we can do to help them think differently about survivorship, particularly during the pandemic? What does it mean to survive well? Are there specific needs that they have? And are there things that we can do? These are all just questions. And yes, I've provided some resources, but what needs to happen is you think globally, but you gotta act locally. So I'm not exactly sure what, what all Case Western has. I know some of the things, but these are the important things to think about. Let me just end with thinking about clinical trials and, and um, let me just look at the time. We don't have much, but I think that this is an important thing, particularly for those of us who are academic centers and we're doing clinical trials and we've got to think who we're designing clinical trials for. Oftentimes the eligibility requirements are so ridiculous that we, not everyone is being included. We talk about the fact that we want to make sure it's representative, but right now clinical trials are not representing all populations. Again, I'm going to use the example of blacks, but I could simply, I could insert Hispanic or, you know, American Indian, you know, we could insert different racial ethnic groups. We could insert adolescent young adults. We could insert older adults, you see, that equity thing. Who are we designing clinical trials for? And I use this example of multiple myeloma. Again, I'm a heme radiation oncologist. And so I saw a lot of patients with multiple myeloma. In the United States, patients with multiple myeloma, 20% of them are African-American or black. But yet of the drugs that have been, have been approved by the FDA, those clinical trials only included about 5% blacks. Why is that? Were the studies not created to ensure that they had the same response to therapeutics? I don't think that's the case. But I think we need to think broadly. Where are the clinical trials being done? Again, I was in the Boston network, but it's not just Boston. This is everywhere where I'm seeing sponsors going to the same places over and over again. And there's really not a commitment to making sure there's equity in clinical trials. It's something we've got to think about. 
you got to think differently about and ensure that everyone has that access. So it may mean changing the elig eligibility requirements. It may mean going to different uh, sponsors, going to different organizations to help be more inclusive. UPenn did a fantastic job. I just want to point you to this. Um, this was an abstract at ASCO that really talked about improving accrual um, to cancer clinical trials by blacks. I, I, of blacks. I, they did a wonderful job of looking at their environment, looking at their community, and making sure that they were being inclusive. So I want to give them a shout out. And then I want to talk a little bit about the work that I did when I was at Wake Forest, where we actually had a population health navigation program that started in the community, started with engagement in the community, started with thinking about people and just kind of getting to know them. And by just doing that, and by making sure that their needs were met while they walked through the cancer center, we were actually able to improve clinical trial enrollment by 50% for each of the populations that we serve. So we can do good work and do good work at the same time, right? <laughs> we can take good care of people. And finally, I just point your attention to this paper that my colleagues and I published um, in January of last year. This is an actionable framework for reduction of of uh, cancer disparities. And while we framed it in cancer, we made it clear that it impacts, it related to COVID-19, it's related to other healthcare uh, venues. Um, and so I'll just point your attention to this as well. And again, you see community engagement is front and center. That's always gonna be my heart. because I think it's really, really important to make sure we're engaged in the community so that we can ask them, what is it that you think we need to do to improve equity for you and your group? So I'm gonna stop there. Um, I really look forward to conversation. I hope that you have a couple of questions for me. We don't have a whole lot of time, um, but this is such an important topic. I wanna thank you so much again for the invitation. I wanna thank the Berman family um, for this continued um, support of this lectureship series. And I'm so grateful and would be very, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Dr. Wingfield, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I wanna remind everyone that um, there's a, another event today with Dr. Wingfield, uh, I guess a, a, a fireside chat with the um, uh, School of Medicine women faculty, Dr. Stiefel. I don't know if you have any details of that. Yeah, so I think I sent out the invitation for that um, earlier. One of the invitations I sent had uh, the wrong passcode, so please look at the most recent invitation. It's a fireside chat. Anyone is welcome, um, particularly junior faculty and trainees are encouraged to attend. And um, Dr. Wingfield's going to talk with her about her career with us. And um, Dr. Tamika Campbell, who's one of our outstanding internists, former chief resident here in the Department of Medicine, is going to be conducting the interview. So anyone who is interested, please um, just email me. I'll also... Um, get off and I'll put the uh, Zoom link in the chat right now. Thanks, Susha. You know, um, Dr. Wingfield, that was a fantastic presentation. I learned this year from um, our, our chief diversity officer that Cleveland, Ohio is actually the most diverse large city in the United States. And, and what you're talking about is so critical for our mission to serve our community. Mm -hmm. Greatly appreciated. And um, again, there's, a, there's one question in the chat. Um, so there's an opinion, opinion piece in the New York Times. Dr. Jess Nutter summarized the day that African-Americans receive too little care in many regards until the end of life. They receive overtreatment when they're dying. What would you do to suggest, very simple question. What would you do to suggest to improve equity at the end of life among cancer patients? Yeah, so um, it's a very interesting um, question. And, you know, some of the work that I did in Boston was around trying to understand the perspectives of black individuals around cancer care and clinical trials. And oftentimes, because they feel so excluded throughout the whole course of their treatment, they are oftentimes late stage and present late. And but they were like, we need to do everything that we can to kind of make sure we've we've exhausted all opportunities. And so there is this this over expenditure. But a lot of it's related to the fact that, number one, they present late to the game. Right. So they want to make sure that they've done everything versus someone who maybe has had an earlier stage diagnosis, has gotten to know the healthcare system, has gotten to trust the providers. Yeah. That trust is important. That trustworthiness is important. And I find even at the end of life, part of it is having the discussion with the patient about how do you want to spend your days? But they need to trust that you're mm -hmm. saying that because you really, truly are interested and invested in them and not that you're just trying to dismiss them. Because you've got to think about the fact that Blacks have traditionally been excluded from the healthcare system. You know, I see another comment in the chat around, well, are Blacks any worse than American Indians? Look, we don't even have the data on American Indian population, which is a shame, right? We're not even collecting the data appropriately. 
And if you think about the fact that we oftentimes, even though I talked about SOGI data, we're not collecting sexual orientation, gender identity, we still aren't doing a great job collecting race and, and ethnic data, right? Mm -hmm. People make assumptions about whether someone is black or white or whether they're Asian. And so oftentimes American Indians get lumped into a white category when they're not. And so the demographics aren't real. So frankly, when you look, if you go into some of the tribal communities, you look at some of the issues, particularly around cancer, I can speak to that because I've worked with the Eastern Band of Cherokee. North Carolina, for those of you who don't know, has the largest American Indian population east of the Mississippi. So I've worked with the nations. And it's, it's true, they have very difficult and very comparable disparities that we see across the board in many of these diseases. Yeah. So I think these concepts are really important. So I love the question about what do we need to do differently? We've got to talk to the communities. We've got to find out what their needs are so that we can meet them in a different way. Why is it that blacks are using more you know, resources towards the end of life? Ask them. And part of it, again, is they felt like they were disenfranchised from an early perspective, because they were. And they want to just make sure that they're doing everything they can to help support their, their family. Awesome. Yeah. I learned something else from, from your, your, uh, your answer. I did not know that. That's so interesting about North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, um, we have time for one or two more questions. If anybody wants to jump in or, or uh, uh, put it in the chat. Again, as, as Dr. Uh, oh, go ahead. Let me, let me just ask a question of Karen. Again, that was a fantastic uh, lecture. Thank you so much. With regard to the disengaged and minority populations, how do you generally approach them about COVID vaccine hesitancy? Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, if you look at some of the national data, that's improving over time, yes. but uh, what, is your, what are your comments about that, please? Yeah, so I think there were, there were certainly a lot of um, assumptions made about which communities were gonna be hesitant to, to take the vaccine. We learned that in my right. work with the NIH SEAL teams. Um, there were a lot of assumptions being made. If you look at what happened in the American Indian population, here's one example of where the American Indian population really stepped up. They were not, they were not getting the vaccine, but it was about an education program that was actually leveraged by the tribes themselves, the tribal nations themselves, and they actually have probably one of the best vaccine rates in the nation, right? So it's amazing. But there are, is still some hesitancy, and I'm actually seeing it, we're seeing it more actually in rural white populations. Um, there still are in rural black populations as well, some hesitancy to, to getting uh, the vaccine. Part of it is understanding what the hesitancy is. We are now over a year in, in terms of having vaccine. We have the data. Originally it was people were waiting because they want to see the data. Now we have it. Um, so it's really about who we are. Are we trustworthy? Do we have trustworthy partners? One of the things that we've done with the SEAL teams is make sure that it's not just about the academic institutions, but making sure there are community partners who are part of the work, who are invested in the work, who are invested in making sure that the communities are healthy. And that's just one example of, of ways that we can actually start to leverage the community members who are trusted community members to help impact flow of information and also making sure there's access. Because I'm still hearing that there's some access issues testing sites have closed, you know, vaccine sites have closed. And so access can be an issue. Um, so working with pharmacies are really important as well, particularly those that might be um, more highly visible in some of the communities of color and, and not forgetting to use our pharmacists as, as wonderful proponents um, for some of this work as well. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Dr. Winfield. You know, it's after one o'clock. So I wanna thank the Berman family for their many years of support of this annual lecture. Thanks, Dina, for putting things together like she does every year. And, and most importantly, thank Dr. Winkfeld for a uh, really inspiring presentation and remind everybody, Women uh, Faculty School of Medicine event at 4 p.m. And Usha put a link in the chat. Any, any last comment, uh, Usha? <laughs> no, I just wanna thank the Berman family for making this talk possible and thank Dr. Winkfield for her time. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to getting to know you better this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.